Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, bless us with the wisdom to praise you in spirit and in truth, so by following your holy will, we may gain eternal salvation. Amen. Well, I welcome you here this morning for the second of our Sunday Masses. Uh, this morning we had that quick recited Mass uh, with no sermon. I think that's the big draw, the no sermon, so they come for that. Uh, but now it's still a gorgeous day. Uh, I've got a little bit of a cross breeze coming through, so I'm hoping these candles stay lit. They haven't for too long, but uh, it's just too nice to close the doors or anything. So as we do gather together as God's people in God's house on this beautiful day from God, I ask you to please make a private examination of your conscience. And we now recite and feed here together. I confess to the Almighty God, one of the Holy Trinity, who knows the innermost secrets of my heart, that I have sinned in God, word, and deed, by my call, by my call, by my own great call. In your presence, O God, I publicly express sorrow for the many sins by which I have offended you. I resolve to amend my life to improve and sanctify it in every henceforth to serve you faithfully. All the days of my life. I ask all those who dwell within the Church of Christ, the Blessed Mother Mary, the Holy Apostles, the Martyrs, and Faithful, who have lived, suffered, and died in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, as well as you, my brothers and sisters, to witness my confession and pray for me to our Lord God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and remission of our sins. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ absolve you, and with his authority vested in me, I absolve you from all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Show us your mercy, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, most gracious Father, that in purity of heart, we may worthily fulfill this holy action, establish remembrance of the Last Supper and the death of Jesus Christ, and for our sanctification and salvation. Be present among us, Jesus, our most perfect Master, because you said that where two or three are gathered together in my name, you are among them. We also ask, Lord, that through this holy liturgy, we may experience a spiritual revival and a better understanding of your holy will, bringing us together in one great family, guided by your commandments and by love, truth, and justice. Amen. And may we say together, let us praise the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God indivisible, revealed in triune power for all time, now, and forever. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to people on earth. persecution or famine, or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. 
we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord gives food to all flesh. God's love endures forever. Praise, Praise God in heaven. God's love endures forever. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. He brings me into the banquet hall. His emblem over me is love. Alleluia. Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God. You cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. In your mercy, cleanse me so I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips, that I may worthily proclaim this holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. by himself. The crowds heard of this, and they followed him on foot from their own towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their ill. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted place, and it is already late. Dismiss the crowds so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, There is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, Five loaves and two fish are all that we have here. And then he said, Bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up into the heavens, Jesus said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, twelve wicker baskets. Those who ate were about five thousand men, not counting the women and the children. This is the gospel of the Lord. church supposed to be? 
You know, we know the theological answer, but what do we think church is supposed to be? For some people, church is only ritual and regimen, and they don't see any need for it in their relationship with God. They can walk by a lake, they can walk through the woods, they can go out to breakfast with friends. They don't need to have this to find God. For others, church is an obligation, and so they're afraid of not going to church. It's one of those religious practices that has to be followed, not so much because you love God, maybe, because you're afraid of going to hell. Now, for still others, church is so holy that it is separated from most of the rest of their lives. Now, I know a lot of people will joke and say, I go into a church, you know, the ceiling will come down. But behind that joke may be the idea that I simply don't belong in there, that it's too other for me, that church is where God is, and, you know, I during the week I just am so other than God, it's not good for me to be there, and so people don't come. And still others may think of church as a place that always has poinsettias or lilies, either has brides or caskets, and they have no idea of what goes on in between. So there must also be people, thank God, who come to church to feel closer to Jesus. And there are probably a lot more ways that I haven't even thought of how to answer that question, what is church supposed to be? But all of these answers that I have offered, maybe not the ones that you whisper in the privacy of your own thoughts, but the ones that I all said, they lacked one important, actually essential ingredient to the answer. The idea of church goes back to the idea of synagogue. Because remember, we started off as Jewish people. The church was a Jewish organization that eventually became a Christian organization, but our example was the synagogue. And synagogues existed at the same time as the Jewish temple. But the Jewish temple was not really where Jesus felt at home. When Jesus went to worship on that Sabbath, those Sabbaths in his life, it was most often in the synagogue. The Jews believed that God resided in a special and extravagant way in the temple. It was a unique place in all the world where heaven and earth touched. However, Jews lived everywhere, and they simply could not always be at the temple every Sabbath or every holy day, and so they came together wherever they were. But they didn't just come together on their own. They really believed that they were called to come together by God. And that's the definition of a synagogue, a called congregation. The reason that synagogues were there was that God wanted his people to come together. So the definition of church is based on the idea of synagogue. It's almost basically the same. Church is a community called together by God in the body of Christ. So what's present in the definition of church that was absent in the ones that I mentioned above and that seems to be absent in that drive-in church is the necessity, the absolute necessity of community, of coming together. To belong to a church in some essential fashion means being a called community. You simply can't do it in your own time. You simply can't do it in a car listening to the radio and sharing a little piece of bread in a, in a cup that has a little plastic covering that you open up. and read. That's not community. You may be receiving Jesus, but you're not receiving each other. In church is community. Church is not only repeating the same words, even though that's what most of the stuff is that we do here. It's not a get out of hell free card. You can't come to church on Sunday and be a saint and be a miserable sinner on Monday. It's not so holy as to be strange or strange because we only visit on a couple times a year. And surprisingly, it's not only about Jesus. The church has to include the idea of community, or as we tend to say, congregation. You know, it may sound really trivial when we're talking about such things as church, as the body of Christ, but whatever activities we do to help build community helps to build the church. Now, the most important community of the church is always going to be the congregation at worship. But when we congregate for even things, like the upcoming barbecue, it's not only a fundraiser, it's a chance for us to get together, to know each other, to be having fun with each other, and build relationships with each other. That's why we also do the barbecue. I know it pays the bills, but it also is a chance to come together as community. Or when the wives of our families get together for a weekend cookout, like we're gonna do this coming Friday, that's not only to have a hamburger and a beer, that is to come together and help build community. Or when the young people go off to retreat, like Allie over here is going to go off to retreat and go up into the woods with other kids from the diocese. 
that is not just going out there to have bonfires. That is to build community. And especially when kids stay after church and have school of Christian living, that is to build community. It's not only about learning lessons about God, it is building community. All of these gatherings help to build a stronger church. And then when the fall comes, don't ever think of coffee hours as just something unimportant you do after church. That has also got a real important process in building church itself. And don't imagine that any work projects are just to get things done around the church building. All of these things come together to build church. Now today's gospel is a familiar one. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And I don't have to talk about it too much because we're going to spend another hour discussing it tomorrow at Bible study. So why not come back here again tomorrow, help build church again by strengthening community, and we can talk more about the miracle of the loaves. But there's an underlying message in that story beyond a lot of bread and a lot of fish. And the message may be that Jesus brought out community among all of those people. John the Baptist has just been executed. The people are upset. He was, uh, he was a Messiah-like figure. He was, a, he was one that was drawing people away from the established religion and away from the Roman establishment. And he was building community out there in the wilderness. And then they killed him because of that. And then all these people, they're wondering, is Jesus the next John? And so they follow Jesus. And Jesus goes off to the wilderness to be by himself because he's mourning the death of John. And they all come together. And I think sometimes you know, there's different stories of the 5,000. You may know the story about you know, there's a little boy here and he has some bread and fish. That's not in Matthew's gospel. Jesus asked the disciples, you bring what you have to me. He blesses it and shares it. And so the idea is, is that they had food. The disciples had food. They didn't say, we're going to share it with others, but we're going to keep this food for ourselves. So Jesus get rid of them and tell them to go get their own food. And Jesus says, no, don't tell them to go away. We have enough. And all of a sudden, everybody said, well, I'll share mine as well. And all of a sudden, you have the building of community. Maybe he was able to get them to share what they had, so that even the ones who came completely unprepared, they had something as well. And you know, the same thing happens today. That was a miracle on that side of that mountain. We could do the exact same thing today. There's enough resources in this world to take care of everyone so that no one ever had to starve to death. No one ever had to die with flies over their body because no one was there to care for them. But there are some people who simply, I have to say, have too much, and they don't need that much. Well, my daughter Amanda's friend, she's working out in a very exclusive area, in an exclusive yacht club, and so she meets in a lot of people, and, and some guy, she's a very attractive young lady, the, some guy took her out to brunch and said, you want to go to dinner? She, and eventually she went out to dinner, took her in a jet, flew her to Boston just for dinner. Wonderful things. But there's another guy who brags about being a bum. He says, I've never worked a day in my life. He's 30-something years old. Never worked a day in his life. And he has a compound in the center of this exclusive area, another compound that's down by the water. Mom and dad built the son a house here and the daughter a house there. Never had to work a day in his life. Now, I don't think Anybody needs to have that much money when other people are starving to death. We can build community just like Jesus built community on the side of that mountain, but sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it involves sacrifice. Sometimes it means taking a look at the other person and what they need, and not just how much I can keep. So maybe a group of strangers became a community on that mountainside because they said, whatever I have, I'm willing to share a little bit of it. And no one went away hungry. But when that happened, everything changed. So what a powerful miracle that is. Don't count that as not being a miracle. He changed people. He brought people together who were on that mountainside originally went there as individuals. It's one of the most important blessings that Jesus may offer us. Separation is an evil. Think about the consequences when community disintegrates. Think about the whole world situation. Think about how scary right now Russia is to us. Think about how scary right now little, tiny, impoverished North Korea is because they have a nuclear-tipped weapon. Think about how us as Americans, we're just kind of not as close as we once used to be. We all kind of look back with, with longing to that World War II era when we really felt as one. I don't think we feel that anymore. Our national motto used to be, E pluribus unum, out of the many, one. And maybe that's a message that we need to reinstate. 
It's great that in God we trust, but we've got to work with him too. We need to work at building community, ending separation, and there may be a miracle involved with this, but it's our work working with God that turns it into a miracle. And what a great place this, right here, is to start. To start building a community as God's house among God's people and as God's church, his congregation. May Jesus help us to discover the miracle of what's possible when we separate all of the, the possibilities that want to pull us apart and separate us so that we can see the power and the blessings of community. And for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord, to gather before your all for this time, we do offer special prayers for Bishop Francis Rubinsky, who died on August 4th of 1990. He was the fourth prime bishop of our church. We also offer prayers still for Richard Slauenwhite, uh, and who was undergoing treatment for his cancer, as offered by Marianne Foster. We offer prayers for Liz Bridgman, battling cancer, raising three young girls on her own. Alex, a 16-year-old with lymphoma Hodgkin's disease. Alicia, a young mother of three with stage four breast cancer. It's all offered by Cindy Benjamin. We offer our prayers for Frank Skrowski, as offered by the Skrowski, Gates, and Kirkendall families. We also offer our prayers for Meg Connors, uh, as offered by um, Ellen and Don Skrowski, and she is battling cancer. We offer our prayers for Richard Poe, as offered by the Poe and Foster families, and also young Jackson Lay is offered by Marianna Foster. Are there other intentions that you would like to offer from the congregation at this time? I didn't know that. Well, um, Walter and Mariana were here at the first one, and Chris is there. That, that's wonderful to hear. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Anything else? Okay. All right. Lord, for all these intentions, plus the ones that we keep in the privacy of our thoughts, and Lord, we also ask you to bless each and every one of us here gathered, to also be with those of our parish who are unable to be with us here today, and of course, those of our parish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for all these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father.
But I beseech you to accept and to bless these gifts, these presents, these holy unspotted sacrifices, which your holy church receives from you, employing you to defend and guide them throughout the world, together with her priests and all true believers of the holy faith. Remember, Lord, your servant. In view of the faith in your holy care, your rule, and fatherly love, hold heartily this day, be united in spirit with all of those, beginning with the most blessed Mother Mary, Mother of Jesus Christ, likewise his apostles, with all the countless hosts of martyrs and confessors who lived, labored, and suffered for the same holy cause which Jesus Christ sacrificed his life and his most precious blood. Just as they believe, professed, and united with you through prayer in this immaculate oblation, which you have instituted for the beginning of the world in a time fulfilled through Jesus Christ and gave it to humanity as a pledge of eternal salvation. So we too today profess and unite ourselves with you, most gracious Father, in humbleness of spirit, and accept from your hands this holy bread and this precious chalice as a longed-for gift bestowed on us by the Savior of the world as spiritual food and drink. He promised us this food and drink in that moment when he revealed his divine power by the multiplication of bread and feed him with a hungry multitude of people. Afterward, he foretold to give him that food and drink to his disciples and friends as a more excellent nourishment when he said, It is my Father who gives you the real heavenly bread. I myself will living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. The bread I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And afterwards, when the temple and messianic life of the divine teacher and year of the covenant was drawing to a close, he gathered into the upper room, all of those whom he had loved in a singular way and had chosen to continue his work of salvation. He spoke to them words of deep love, longing, and resolve. I will not leave you orphaned. I will come back to you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Do not be distressed or fearful. You will suffer in the world, but take courage. I have overcome the world. If you live in me, and my words stay a part of you, you may ask what you will, and it will be done for you. Anyone who loves me will be true to my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. I consecrate myself for their sakes now, that they may be consecrated in truth, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be made complete. Father, all those you gave me, I would have in my company, where I am to see this glory of mine, which is your gift to me, because of the love you bore me before the world began. I myself am the bread of life. No one who comes to me shall ever be hungry. No one who believes in me shall ever thirst. After these and the other words of the archpriestly prayer and with holy fervor, the Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which is given for you. In like manner after supper, taking this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands. Again he gave thanks to you, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink of it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which shall be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. resurrection and his glorious ascension, we receive from your own gifts and presence a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance as from him who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts and with an unshakable faith 
that they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly ask you, Almighty God, to command that our offering be brought by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar and in the presence of your divine majesty. That we who receive the most sacred body and blood of your Son from this altar may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and have passed on to eternity. To these souls, Lord, and to all who rest in Christ, grant everlasting life. And to those who are in life strayed from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your fatherly love, mercifully shorten their sufferings. We ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs and all your saints, who shed their blood for your name, their hearts are always open to justice and mercy, and with lives patterned after their divine master, merited eternal joy. Number us in their company, Lord, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. But when we always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and freely give us all these good things. Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. 
Do not look at our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and the unity of your kingdom, for you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father, the work of the Holy Spirit, your death brought life to the world. By your holy body and blood, free me from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me be parted from you, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the partaking of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, not be caused for my judgment. Though I am unworthy to receive this great sacrament, through your loving kindness may become my safeguard and healing remedy. My saving master awaken in me a living faith, fervent love, worship, adoration, and a holy longing. Through this communion, make me your willing servant, zealous to fulfill your holy will. May it at last unite me entirely with you, my Lord and my God. Grant this who lives reigns to God the Father in unity with the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. I will take the bread of heaven, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy to see you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Shall I return to the Lord for all the graces that He has rendered unto me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise will I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. With the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy to see you, but I will say the word, and I shall be healed. The 
body and the blood of Christ. The body and the blood of Christ. The body and the blood of Christ. Darkness that did not overcome it. 
There was a man named John sent by God who came as a witness to testify to the light so that through him all might believe, but only to testify to the light, for he himself was not the light. The real light which gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through him the world was made, yet the world did not know who he was. To his own he came, and his own did not accept him. And he who did accept him, he empowered to become children of God. These are they who believe in his name, were begotten not by blood, nor by carnal desire, nor by man's willingness, but by God. And the word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of an only Son coming from the Father, filled with enduring love. Thanks be to God. Thank you.